Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are going to be discussing a case that is in highly done and uh, talked about for years. A case that happened back in 1959 in Russia regarding nine hikers that went off to complete a Category 3 hike and after missing their rendezvous, searchers were sent out and what they found was a crazy tragedy. So the group was originally expected back by February 12th but when they missed that rendezvous, the searchers actually didn't start out until February 21st, and it wasn't until February 26th that they found the tent and a small uh, trail of footprints leading away from it that leaded down about one mile to a forest line to uh, a cedar tree where they found the first two bodies. And with that, let's get into the details. So today on Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail, we are going to be discussing the Dyatlov Pass incident, which occurred back in Russia in the Ural Mountains in 1959. So remember, this was Soviet Russia, a very different time than today. So the Dyatlov Pass incident is a mysterious death of nine hikers. Um, back in 1959, like I said, the group consisted of eight men and two women. Most were students or graduates of the Ural pa Polytech Institute. And they were basically going out on a 14-day expedition to reach Mount Ortorton, a mountain that was two, ten kilometers, six miles uh, north of the site of the incident. Now, this route during the season was categorized as Category 3, the most difficult, which all of them were trying to achieve. They started their march towards Ortorton, on January 27th. However, the next day, one of the members, Yuri Yudin, had to leave because he fell sick. I believe it was sciatica, nerve pain. Uh, the hike started out fairly late on February 1st and only traveled four kilometers the day. Um, excess gear and food was stored on a platform called the Labaz um, as a camp base so that they could get it on their way back. And then camp that night was set up around 5 p.m. on the slope of Kolatsiakla a distance of roughly 10 miles from their intended destination. Here is where I believe they made one of their first mistakes. They set up camp on the slope um, in a blizzard basically and for whatever reason the, the forest line wasn't that far away, about one mile exactly. And uh, ultimately I think this was the first of a series of events that led to this tragedy. According to Yuri Yudin, the only surviving member of the group, he believes that they did this so that they didn't lose the elevation gain that they had already gotten. Uh, two members, uh, Simeon Zolotolyov and Nikolai Thiero Brignoli, were thought to have been outside the tent when the catastrophe, whatever that was, happened. To date, there has been no consensus on what that catastrophe was that made them flee that t tent that night. Igor Dyatlov, pictured here, was the group's leader, highly intelligent, and studied geoengineering, and the uh, whole pass was eventually named after him due to this uh, unfortunate, horrible incident. Uh, this is one of his last postcards uh, that he sent to his family, and it, it basically says that they were having fun, you know, things were well. When his body was found, uh, they did a cursor examination and it was thought that he died of hypothermia and that does seem to be the consensus. He was found about 300 meters from the cedar tree on February 27th in sort of a position indicating that he was heading back to the tent. Now I'm going to go over um, each of the people individually and I'm going to post some of the things so you can go back and look at it because there really is so much information and Igor Dyatlov's body had abrasions on his hands, his legs, and uh, some on his face as well, but uh, he had died of hypothermia. Zenaida Kolmogorova was one of the female members of the group, obviously. Uh, she was highly intelligent, very well liked, supposedly like the joy and center of the group. Everybody liked being around her. She was very friendly. She had been on many, many hikes in the past and had a lot of experience. During one of her previous expeditions, she had actually been bitten by a viper, and she refused to lighten her load. She went on, did the whole rest of the hike by herself, carrying all her weight. Uh, she was also found, and a pose suggested heading back to the tent, and she had died from hypothermia. Uh, this was, uh, her body was found by actually one of the search dogs um, under about two feet of snow. She had abrasions on her hand and one big bruise on her side that looked what they called a batten mark. Yuri Doroshenko 
was thought to be the most sturdiest member of the group. He was a fourth year student of radio engineering. He had a very impersonal, impulsive personality and was famous for the school's hiking club for having once run off a giant bear with a geologist hammer while on a camping trip. He was also at one point involved with a, in a relationship with Zineda Komogorova, who we just spoke about, although they had broken up prior to this trip, but remained in a friendship-type relationship. He was only 21 years old when he died. He was found wearing a sleeveless shirt. Um, he was basically almost completely naked. Um, in the hair of the deceased, the expert found particles of moss and pine needles. His hair was burned. His ears and nose were covered with blood. Um, all kinds of small abrasions, and he was found under the cedar tree next to his comrade Yuri Krivonoshenko, who was also basically almost completely naked, only in their underwear. Yuri was also found basically in his underpants, had bruises on his forehead, bruises around his left temporal bone, palm on his right hand, had blue pulp and stuff from the tree in it, uh, which indicated that he might have been trying to climb up the tree, and he was also a very athletic young man. He was a runner in very, very good athletic shape. He was found directly next to his comrade, frozen, and had died of hypothermia. This is what the bodies looked like after they had uncovered them. These two bodies were found under an old cedar tree roughly one mile from the tent site location next to a makeshift fire that seemed to have lasted only about an hour. And after study of the bodies, they determined that due to liver mortis, they could tell that the bodies had been moved after they had perished, uh, believing that they had relinquished their clothes to their comrades to help keep them alive. Rustim Slobidin was the next body to have been found about 480 meters from the cedar on March 5th with an um, avalanche probe the day after the autopsy of the first four bodies. He was covered in about 50 centimeters of snow, face down, head towards the tent. He was better dressed than the previously found hikers. He wore a long sleeve shirt, sweater, two pairs of pants, four socks, and a felt boot. Rustim had already graduated the Polytech in 1958 and was working in an Enterprise P.O. box. He was a very athletic, honest, and decent young man. And when he was found, he had a fracture on his right temporal bone, although this was not thought to be the cause of his death. This was not a, a fatal wound. Uh, it was determined after his autopsy that he had too died of hypothermia. Alexander Kolivatov was a student of nuclear physics at the UPI University, and he was currently in his fourth year, and he was one of the uh, last bodies to be found. This is where the investigation totally took a 180. These bodies weren't found until May 5th, and they were in way worse condition and had died of huge, terrible injuries and were found under a crazy amount of snow, almost four meters. Now, his body was much well more insulated than the rest. He was missing a hat and shoes. His upper torso was protected by a sleeveless shirt, long sleeve shirt, sweater, fleece, sweater, and zip jacket. The lower part of his body had long pants, ski pants, and another pair of pants. But he also had uh, his skin was all messed up, his eyes were missing, and it seemed that he had suffered severe internal injuries. Ludomina Dubedina was found up against a rock with a slight creek underneath her. She was in her fourth year student at the UPI University as an engineering and economics major. For the most of the day, she took part in all kinds of activities. And one time during a hike in 1957, she was actually shot in the leg by a hunter. And she bravely suffered through the whole thing without being uh, helped and made it all the way back to uh, help. And out of the group, she was found with the most serious injuries. And she was also the youngest group. Uh, very, very tragic. Her eyes were missing, her tongue was missing. Now, we're going to get into some of this, but I think most of this was due to natural elements. Of a, she was laying up against a creek. She also, basically all of her ribs were broken. Um, she was just absolutely a, in a mess of state. And also the clothes that she was wearing uh, were tested radioactive positive. Although it was evident that these hikers had survived longer than their comrades, they were all found in much worse shape outside of this small den that they had constructed. They all had suffered serious internal injuries that the coroner described could not have happened from anything but like a car accident or severe pressure. 
Nikolai Theobald Brignoli, or Thibault as his friend called him, graduated in 1958 with a major in civil engineering from the UPI University and at the time of his death was working in construction in the department of Sliborovsk. Sorry. He was, however, much better protected against the coldness of the Siberian winter, and that's why I suggested earlier that Solotolyov and uh, might have been outside the tent with Brignoli at the time of the mysterious incident. Both men were much better prepared than the rest of the group when they were forced to abandon the tent. Nikolai had canvas hat, fur hat, knitted wool hat, upper body was well protected, but he also had all kinds of traumatic injuries to his skull fracture, which would have rendered him almost dead within minutes. Simeon Zolotoryov, or Sasha as his friends knew him by, he graduated from the Institute of Minsk in 1950 with a degree in physical education. He was much older than the rest of the group and he had also served in the army. However, before the very hike to Artartan along with the group of Igor Zolotoryov and Kurovaska, he was single, which, which, which looked rather unusual, I guess, for the time, and had some very interesting tattoos and some other interesting things, but he quickly bonded with the group. And when he was found, he was also found with serious, serious injuries, uh, fractures to his skull, his eyes were missing, terrible fractures to his ribs, basically had been crushed. And again, what's interesting was that these were all found um, outside of their little den that they had construction. Now, he was also much better dressed, and he also had a, a camera around his neck, which, again, will lead to some of the conspiracy theories that we'll later talk about. And here in the video, I've included some uh, text documents that you can go back and pause and look at because there really is so much more information that you can see. Uh, this is Yuri Yudin. He was the member that did survive because he left due to illness. And um, he did offer some insight as to why they camped where they did. Uh, he thought that um, Igor was trying to give them experience, that they didn't want to lose the elevation. And it, here he is seen saying his goodbyes to the group. And ironically, like this you know, injury actually saved his life. So after the group failed to make their rendezvous and the search teams were sent out, it wasn't until February 26 that they discovered the tent on the slope of Kolatsiakla in Dyatlov Pass. Ironically, the guy who found it, Slobatov, was a student who was actually um, helped construct the tent three years earlier, and it was actually made from two smaller tents. So he recognized it immediately. And understanding right away that the tent had been cut from the inside, and that there was no hikers inside of it. Here is a drawing of what the, uh, the tent looked like with the big slashes. The one gash kind of off to the left is what Slobatov, the guy who found the tent, he made that cut. So the official report on the tent was this. The campsite is located on the northeast slope of the mountain, 1079 Kolatsiakla, and was about 300 meters from the top of the mountain on the slope of 30 degrees. The campsite consisted of a pad flattened snow. On the bottom are stacked eight pairs of skis for tent support and insulation. The tent is stretched on poles and fixed with ropes. At the bottom of the tent, nine backpacks were discovered with various personal items, jackets, raincoats, nine pairs of shoes. There was also found men's pants, three pairs of boots, warm fur coats, socks, hat, ski caps, utensils, bucket, stove, ax, and a myriad of other foods, biscuits, and all kinds of other things, including cameras and camera accessories. And in one of the holes, Dyatlov's jacket was stuffed into it. Now, the reason the tent is such a big piece of evidence is because why would anybody abandon their tent, especially in blizzard conditions and on such horribly, horribly cold weather? So this is what is really the big mystery. What actually made them leave their tent? What made them cut open a hole in the middle of the night and then walk slowly out. As you can see here, these are the actual footprints that were left, and according to the investigators, they were made by people in bare feet or socks, and they were in a slow calm manner walking down the hill, which had several ridges, which um, I'll have a couple pictures later to show, but this was about a mile from where their tent was to the tree line, and I cannot imagine doing this in blizzard conditions in bare feet in the middle of the night because there were several ridges that I'm sure that they tripped and fell on. So this is what uh, it would have looked like in the modern times. Some hikers went back and put up the tent exactly, or a tent that looked exactly like it in the distance. And the big other piece of evidence is the cedar tree that is often referenced in all of the 
research, um, the first two bodies were found under this cedar tree and along the side of it the branches were broken up to five meters high, which suggested the hikers were trying to either climb the tree, break the branches off for something, maybe to look back at their campsite. Uh, this is sort of a satellite view and it's kind of hard to see, but it really does show the terrain and what they were up against. And um, about halfway between the tent and the wood line, uh, a flashlight was found, and it was in the on position and the batteries had died. Now these pictures were taken in modern day, so this is kind of what, to give you an idea of what it would have looked like today, not in the black and white photos, and exactly where the, the things were, the cedar, the den, the bodies, and so on. So this is kind of gives you a good idea of what it looks like. And again, this is what their den looked like. They had put broken branches, put them down, and then were sitting on various pieces of clothing uh, to try and keep themselves warm. And these last four hikers survived a lot longer than the, the first um, five did. But as you can see, they were obviously crushed under a huge amount of snow. I'm not sure how this happened, but I would guess that uh, there was some sort of uh, maybe small avalanche on the other side that caused their their poor den to collapse and just causing even another tragedy you know they had already endured one tragedy whatever that was and here they just couldn't catch a break i've often wondered if after the mysterious incident if um, they were actually trying to walk down the other direction to get back to their storage but they made a mistake due to it being a blizzard um, they couldn't see until it was too late Anyway, now let's get into some of the theories. I'm not going to go over all of them, but because there's hundreds of them, but here we go. So one of the most popular is a Yeti or Snow Beast, which personally I don't believe happened. Uh, the, this picture is one of the ones that they uh, say is evidence of it, but I put this picture of this guy. He's one of the searchers using an avalanche probe because it looks so similar. It's this, You can obviously tell the first picture is a human, and at least in my opinion, I don't believe that a Yeti caused this. Uh, there was no evidence of that, but, you know, because they did this funny editorial magazine thing and they mentioned snow beasts, of course, that was like the sand that caused the pearl to grow of that one. And then, of course, they had this stove that uh, Igor had actually designed and made for their uh, tent, not only for warmth, but for cooking. But uh, so some believe that because of uh, the stove that uh, it caught fire and they were forced to flee because, you know, this guy, Slobodin, has obviously seen wearing a burnt jacket, so maybe it happened before. But actually, when the tent was found, um, the stove was found in its stowed position and hadn't been used, and there was no evidence of any burning on the inside of the tent or anywhere around. And all the pipes that were usually tied up, if it had been using, they weren't assembled or anything like that. So personally, I think it's kind of a clever thought, but I don't personally believe this is what happened. But again, just my personal opinion. And then, of course, another big common one is UFOs. They saw a UFO that scared them enough to make them flee the tent. And one of the main pieces of evidence is that picture and then this one, which this one is unfortunately just a piece of film that the developer triggered when he was developing the film. It has nothing to do with the case. And this you can actually go and read yourself on the Dyatlov Pass website that I will include with all the information that I've gotten this from. I've taken this all from the real case file, so please feel free to uh, do your own research as well, and I'll have all those links below. Another common theory was military testing. Perhaps uh, the Russian government was testing uh, parachute hydrogen bombs, and one of them exploded near or around the campsite, and this forced the hikers to flee downhill and seek refuge. Again, there's really no evidence of this, but it's hard to say. A lot of this is up for speculation, but that is a very, very big popular theory that um, has been pursued by, by many writers. But I think of the theories we've discussed so far, it's one of the more plausible ones. And then, of course, the natural phenomenon of ball lighting. Lightning, excuse me, is an unexplained atmospheric electrical phenomenon. The term refers to reports of luminous spherical objects vary in diameter by several meters and are usually associated with thunderstorms, but last considerably longer than a split-second flash of lightning bolt. So it's plausible that during a severe blizzard that this could have happened and struck nearby or caused some of the later events. 
Now, one of the most common and also refuted uh, uh, theories is an avalanche or snow slab slide. Now, this I, I don't believe an avalanche happened, but I do think that it could have been a snow slide of some sorts because of the way the tent looks and because of uh, the way that they had pitched the tent the, um, and just the way it was found. I think this is a plausible one. And also because of this um, ski bolt pole in the front here in the foreground, how you see it's bent and the snow just kind of looks piled up on the tent. But again, you know, there's no actual evidence of that. However, I do believe that it was a series of events, not just one event that caused this tragedy. Now, another theory is the Mansi people. They were in the area, and um, again, I, there's no evidence of this, and they were known to be a peaceful tribe, but some believe that maybe the hikers were on their hunting ground, and that they blitz attacked the hikers in the middle of the night and forced them out of their tent and left them for dead. But I don't buy this because translation even says mountain of don't go there. The Mansi people were also very helpful in the investigation and were thoroughly questioned and basically eliminated as suspects. And they helped with the search. So I just don't really feel this was anything to do with it. I think they were just happened to be the nomadic tribe in the area and an easy scapegoat at the time. Now, one of the newer theories, and uh, most recently uh, announced, was the katabatic wind theory. And katabatic uh, wind derives from the work, the Greek word katabasis, meaning descending. This is a type of falling wind that can appear when cold air over a glacier or mountains area starts to flow down the gradient. The phenomenon can be described as a ball rolling downhill by gravity. Gravity, hence, it's also labeled a gravity wind. And some believe that this happened during the night and it was just so intense, like a hurricane force wind, that it forced the hikers to abandon their tent. And yes, this is plausible. But for me, I guess the main thing that I have a problem with is I don't understand why in any of these theories, what was so intense that they wouldn't grab a few clothing items or something to help them protect them against the uh, cold Siberian winter, which they were all familiar with, unless there had something that had toppled onto the tent, rendering it unusable after they had cut it open. I think one of the main reasons that this mystery has been so hard to solve is because people are looking for just one answer or one thing. And I really truly believe that there was a series of events that caused this tragedy. And how that started out, it could have been a snow slide, something that caused them to panic, that crushed their tent a little bit. Maybe they thought it was an avalanche, even though they knew there couldn't be one there. They panicked. But I also think the mistake began earlier where they pitched their tent on that slope, especially during such a crazy storm. This is one of those mysteries that the more you look into it, the more you find, the more questions that arise. And I think that ultimately it was a series of events and not just one particular thing, especially after they found their remaining hikers. Now this is a uh, 3D rendering of how they were found. And I think what happened here was they were doing their best to survive. They built a little den and then just one another tragic blow, it collapsed and crushing them onto these rocks and stream and caused all these injuries and then some of the other phenomenon that we saw like the eyeballs missing and the tongue missing were from them laying on a stream for months. Ultimately I don't know if we'll ever find an answer and there are many other theories that I haven't gone over. Everything from um, wild mushrooms to uh, infrasound to teleportation, gravity fluctuation, uh, wild animals, wolverines, bears, but ultimately, as you look through all these, you can find holes in almost every single one of them. And that's why I really truly believe that this was a series of events that unfortunately happened um, one right after another that ultimately caused the demise of these nine hikers. And it really is a very sad story. They were all so young and all had great careers ahead of them and they, all died in such a horrible way. I mean, imagine being out in the middle of the woods at night in your underpants in a blizzard with nothing. I mean, can't imagine the fear. And ultimately, this could have played a part in things. And what I mean by that is that from their autopsies, it does seem that there was maybe a fight between them. And I'm, I'm talking about after this event occurred, whatever it was that made them leave the tent. 
but I don't understand why the group split up, and I don't understand why the least dressed of the group were heading back to the tent. Why not send the best dressed back to the tent to grab the supplies and then come back? So I think it's very plausible that an altercation between themselves occurred after the incident because of fear. And you know, this is a common thing, a breakdown when when things fall apart. And again, it just adds to the sadness. And what I was referencing by the autopsy reports, all of their hands and knuckles had abrasions on them and their faces had different abrasions that indicated that it looked like they could have been in a fight. Could it have been a fight? Maybe it was just from a fall. I mean, we just don't know. There are so many possibilities here. But again, ultimately, I think that this was just a tragic series of events um, that occurred one right after another. And I do think at some point there was some dissension in the group uh, that they split up. Maybe after their two first comrades died, um, they had attempted to make a fire under the cedar tree. Why not keep it going? You know, there was plenty of dry wood around. There's just so many questions with this case. And look, I know a lot of people are going to get on me because I didn't talk a lot about the radioactive clothes. And because with the research, there were several of them that worked in highly secretive um, nuclear facilities. And it was determined to be their clothes that had the radioactivity on them. And this was also during Soviet Russia. So from the beginning, this investigation was just hampered by so many things. And just recently, the government did, the Russian government reopened the investigation, but even then, they're only looking into a few possible theories. This was, and still is to this day, a big deal to the Russian people and everybody in the world. Everybody wants to know what happened, and they have erected some beautiful monuments for the hikers, both near their burial site and on the mountain at Kolatsiakla, where they perished. And I think that's how, what we should do is just remember how they did live up until that, that time. These were all very young um, people with their whole lives ahead of them. And I can't imagine what their families went through and everybody who knew them. So just hoping that one day they will be able to find closure. And look, I know some people watching this video might be disappointed because I don't have an answer, but that's just because I don't believe there is one single answer. I believe it's a sing series of event events that just happened one right after another and caused this terrible tragedy. And I'm sure I made some mistakes and errors in here, so I apologize about that, and I thank everybody for sticking with me here through the end. And I want to thank uh, the people of the DiatlovPass.com without their information and all their efforts to keep this case alive and all their hard work and research. This uh, video wouldn't have been available. I will leave the link below with all that uh, information so you can check it out because there really is so much information with this case. And I encourage you all to take a look for yourselves. I really thank you for watching and hope everybody is staying healthy and safe during this hard time. Thanks again. Take care. Hey guys, um, I just wanted to say, look, I know I just gave you basically the nuts and bolts on this case, uh, and that's just because there is so much information. I really would encourage you to check out the link I'm going to leave below, that's theatlovepass.com, where you can check out the actual case files and, and fill in some of the gaps. Um, some insight, I do believe that it was originally triggered by some kind of a snow slide. They did find a broken ski a few meters down the slope, and I think maybe that was what caused the bruise on Zeneda during the initial incident. And I do find it very interesting that Zolotaryov had a camera on him, of all things, when some of the people had, didn't even have any clothes. So there are really a lot of mysteries around this. But again, that's just speculation. And like I said, there are so many conspiracy theories. There's so many theories re uh, revolving around this case. So much information um, that trying to put it all into a YouTube video, like covering every single aspect would be like a six hour long video. And there are many other YouTube videos on this. Lots of wonderful YouTubers have covered this. So I highly suggest you check out some of their videos, give you a broader perspective of it. And yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. I've studied this case for a long time and there really are just so many clues and different things if you check out the case files. 
uh, you really will get absorbed in it. I mean, the people at theatlawpass.com have done a wonderful job of keeping all the information together and adding to it as more comes in. As you know, most of these files weren't even unlocked by the Soviets until like the late 70s and in the 90s. And so anyway, I definitely highly recommend you check out that site and 